And welcome to Sunrise Daily. I am Chamberlain Uso, live from Abuja. Good morning, indeed, live from Abuja. I'm about <laughs> well. Thank you. Well, most certainly something very interesting there. Am I making a good morning? This is Lagos, and you're welcome. <laughs> also reporting from Lagos. Good morning and welcome to Sunrise Daily on Channels Television. I am Bukola Samuel Wemimo. It's good to be back. Are you? Well, it's actually very good to have a partner here. So it's a fair balance between Lagos and Abuja. For those of you who don't know, well, this is Bukola Samuel Wemimo, just in case you don't know. <laughs> okay, saying. so apart from a check on dates, there's also a check on your colleagues. Well, a check on dates, by I the way. I that, by th the way. That reminds me, today is uh, November 15th, right? The 15th, yes. absolutely. Yeah. Just wanted you to know. Okay. <laughs> I, I think it's, it's day two of the UNWTO um, conference. Mm. Uh, as a tourism um arrangements that that you know that, that channel television is also partnering with there are so many the world is looking at africa as the next tourism destination and for god's sake please we have a lot i mean people come to nigeria from all parts of the world they want to go away with something i mean look at that um, the, the, the what the king uses i don't know what the english word is Irukere. Irukere. <laughs> well, i don't know what the english word is either <laughs> want to go with beads want to go with hats so things made from nature and all of that so it's always something exciting for many people who don't know that these things you know are there they do exist for us so it is it is wonderful to know that that is happening and cheering also that an organization like channels television is partnering with that the 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 interesting part of it is what exactly do we sell when we talk about culture Beg your pardon, when, when we talk about tourism, essentially we're selling culture. I mean, you go to any part of the world, you want to take something, an insignia mm -hmm. of sorts, from that country Absolutely. to your home. So people know that you have been there. That is why they will sell you a shirt or a hat or something that says, welcome to this country, or this is from this country, and all of those things. There are some things that are peculiar to certain countries. When I was growing up, the only place, the tourism place we went to was the bar beach and what did we <laughs> what did we come back with we always came back with shells, shells. seashells <laughs> yeah. that's all some even came back with the sand with the sand yeah. yes <laughs> and they would put this the sand in a bowl put the shells on it you know and all of those things so i, I don't when was the last time i saw a shell but snail shells maybe i see but <laughs> no, but any other. so uh the essentially what we sell is culture it's what we have is uh, culture tradition dressings you see some pictures i mean of cultural dressings and all those things it's always there we have these things and we've had qu a couple of conversations on this particular conference the question is how do we market them everybody knows what and the, the, it's a three-leg uh, conference right uh, creative industry, um, culture, culture, and tourism. And, tourism. and you know that, that Nigeria's creative industry is actually quite huge now. Yeah. Music, comedy, and movies. Fast selling all over the world. How do we market these things and sell them? That is That's a, a big job. question. Mm. Uh, and indeed, Ayo, you know, when it comes to um, culture, uh, there's a surfeit of antique and antiquity that Nigeria mm. has to sell to mm. the international community. If you talk about, just to mention a few, the uh, artistic groove in Oshun State, the Oshun Oshobo Festival, the Ogunike Caves, the, um, um, uh, what's that uh, place called now, in Ondo State, the Dora Hills, mm -hmm. uh, the Confluence Town. Yeah. Uh, I could go on and so on. Many, so many, so of many of them. That There's one of them that is actually very rare in the world, the, the Suspended Lake. That one is in uh, Addo Hawaii, close to what you're saying in Oyo State. Yes, so we have all of that to sell to the international community. But the big question, you know, just to tie to that which you asked is how prepared are, mm. are we? How ready are we? You know, uh, there's some critical sectors that are tied to tourism and that is uh, hospitality that is transportation and as far as transportation is concerned in Nigeria uh, there's a big problem uh, in recent times people are afraid they are scared of traveling by road mm. even as close as Ibadan people are scared of traveling to Ibadan so if you were to um, you know decide for instance that uh, you would rather have your vacation or just to visit a, a, a cultural site within Nigeria and you didn't want to travel outside the 
the country, your options are very, very limited. Mm -hmm. Well, indeed, the hospitality sector is, uh, you know, is even struggling amid the, uh, uh, you know, uh, the, the tight, uh, austere economy. Yeah. But all the other sectors are not quite prepared to carry uh, Nigeria's tourism and sell it to the international community. So it, mm. it's really sad because it, it, it would be a, a huge loss of mm. what would have been a, a great contribution of GDP to, to, to Nigeria's gross domestic product. Mm. Well, but indeed, the creative industry is very prepared and mm. doing well and selling quite a bit of Nigeria in terms of the Nigerian story, uh, the Nigerian history to the international community. But the other supporting sectors, uh, they still leave much to be desired. Which also underscores the importance of this conference that has been held. And mind you, it is a global tourism conference. So. Several people from the world are here. From the last conversation we had, uh, the organizers said they are expecting 20, at least 20 countries to come into Nigeria to you know, bring all of their own and take some of ours away with them. Um, so how we all take these on board, I guess that's another conversation altogether. Well, I don't know of many tourism um, locations in, in Abuja, Abuja. But I think I know about <laughs> Zuma Rock, and you, I, I you know that there's also, there's, also, <laughs> there's also the context of whether or not it is in Abuja. Hey, guys, over to you. Well, well, we'll just let you do, you know, what you like to do. Maybe you just want to go ahead and check. We won't get in your way while you try to discover a lot more of the other tourist sites in Abuja. But speaking of which, and uh, several other things playing out in the polity. Yesterday, for instance, the presidential candidate of the All Progressive Congress and that of the People's Democratic Party, well, uh, they had a chit chat. They met on their way actually out of the nation's capital. And then they got down and then just having a nice, pleasant chit chat. And you know, this kind of visuals are actually good for uh, particularly what the country is trying to focus on the National Peace Initiative, Peace Accords, ensuring peaceful elections devoid of violence. I mean, you can have some sort of you know, rank all based on principles, but to let it degenerate into fisticuffs is what the country doesn't want to see. Security agencies themselves have been issuing several caution. But it's also equally hugely important for supporters to understand that politics, the way politicians see it, is completely different from the way supporters relate with it. For them, it's a game of interest. They see platforms as vehicles to get to wherever they want to get to. So you need to know, we need to know, while we go about the way support, yeah, you can support whichever party you want to, but you need to understand that it shouldn't cost anyone's lives, no matter what happens. Because as you see that, who knows, of course, they're friends, they will always meet behind the scenes. So now you can understand that when they make certain statements, They'll make it in this context, perhaps with a certain context and background, understanding that, yeah, some of this talk will just be politics. We'll get back to the table and jaw jaw and not war war. So why shouldn't they support us for the suit? <laughs> Excuse me, I think it's only recently that um, a journalist, Simon Kolawole, uh, you know, wrote a book. Uh, it's all politics. Uh, but I think that, you yeah. know, it, yeah, the title is the title of a whole book now. It's, it's all politics. Uh, so when you see a lot of things happening, um, you know, where politicians seem to be at each other's throats, they know the game they're playing. Oh, they yeah. know it's a game. Um, only recently I had cause to interview the uh, director general of the Labour Party um, presidential campaign, Dr. Doyo Kukwe, and uh, he was saying, oh, the APC, the, the ruling party, let me use the word he used, the ruling party, uh, did us... Um, is it did us a dirty one or something oh. like that, you know, did, did, or did us a nice one. Something to that effect, to the effect that he understood that this is a game and that, you know, even though it's a game that eventually has an effect on people's lives and also has an effect on people's destinies, the destiny of a country. I mean, if it's not played properly, if it's not played within the rules, but they usually understand uh, that there are certain ways to play and that, you know, when... Uh, you know, you're going outside the understood rules, then they know you're playing dirty. 
Do you understand? So uh, as, as, as we, these kind of visuals are good, I hope that their supporters are also imbibing this because we know how toxic politics can get. Yeah. And, at, and at the end of the day, we really worry this time around. I think there's a strong worry as to you know, the job of work that the person who is going to win this uh, contest, you know, the job of work that that person will have to do um, at the end of the day to be able to pull every other person together. I mean, pull all the other contestants and their supporters, more importantly, their supporters together mm -hmm. to be able to say, let's move forward. Uh, and for those who continue to you know, say that we need right now a government of national unity, that we need to see how we can, whether it's something that's going to be constitutional or how you know, we, maybe we develop a tradition where um, you know, there, is, there should be a way we incorporate even those who did not win, maybe according to the portion of, according to the portion of uh, votes or percentage of polls you get at the vote. Because to think that all of that knowledge, um, to think that all of that yeah. um, you know-how know, know is just going to go to waste because you, know, you didn't win. Uh, and that's only one person who won maybe a certain fraction mm. of the elections, you know, of the votes, will be the one to, because you want majority, will be the one to rule, you know, oftentimes alienates and continues to make our politics this all or nothing. Yeah. This uh, infuses this um, iota of desperation. And now we need to do something about it. But in the meantime, as you said, this is good, even though we need to start questioning them. This is the second time they're meeting at this Abuja Airport. Why do they always meet Why like coincidentally, right? Hey, this is becoming too much of a coincidence. So I, I don't know if there's anything to it. Maybe this is something that they are orchestrating from time to time. Maybe it's a way of trying to douse tension. We don't know. But whatever it is, it's certainly good optics. And I hope that their supporters yeah. um, are also getting these pictures so that they understand that, yes, much as this is, uh, is election period and you're going to be voting for one person or the other, it, it should not bring enmity between you and your next neighbor. Yeah, there are several things to learn from some of these things in terms of the principles, really, not just the... I know many of you have challenges in terms of how you see the way they go about certain things, but very huge, important point that you also highlighted the zero-sumness of our politics, it's something that, that's why all the, this fight, this do or dies kind of fight always happens. So what about proportional representation? But I think that's something that we'll take a look at much later in the days ahead. So by all means, you can also weigh in and let us know what you think about what's going on. But of course, we still have a lot of grounds to cover. So we'll just go right ahead and jump in and take a look at some of the dailies for you as much as we can. Take a look at New Telegraph, for instance. I think it feeds into the narrative of what we're just trying to talk about here today. It's about 2023. That's a theme you see on the front page of New Telegraph. And the big lead there, Abdul Salam Kuka, troubled by verbal wars among political actors. So this is what's been going on for a while now. And so they're lending their voice, voices to reason, appealing to that uh, good person inside every one of us to uh, bring it out and look at the writers say their intemperate language intimidation outright violence disappointing perhaps to say the least i might add uh, charge presidential candidates to rein in spokespersons warn candidates will be held responsible for utterances made on their behalf how about that? So that is a big one right here. Well, yes, indeed, there are quite a number of uh, other interesting scenarios playing up, but um, I'd like to leave it at that with New Telegraph this morning. Well, let's take a look at what leadership has for you on its front page. Uh, you also see there, focusing largely on politics, but this time around from INEC, INEC audits reports indict APC, PDP, others for overspending. Uh, looks like this is certainly not for these elections. <laughs> because they audit reports, so um, they cannot audit what has not been done yet. Yeah, so it's the last one. Most likely 2019 election. So you might want to see the story for page, on page four of the paper. I wonder paper. What, if there's a consequence. Yeah. Well, that will be another kettle of fish, but look at this, pointed issue. 
major parties exceeded 1 billion Naira campaign spending in 2015. Mm. APC generated 604.5 million Naira, spent 2.9 billion Naira, leaving a deficit of 2.3 billion Naira. PDP raised 799 million Naira, spent 9.53 billion with a deficit of 8.7 billion Naira. INEC yet to complete audit of 2019 elections can't prosecute electoral offenders. Does that answer your question? Okay. <laughs> so is that they don't have the capacity to or they don't have the... I don't know what they don't have. But you might want to, you know, flip to page four to see what that is about. And see if there's any recommendation. Perhaps. You know, they've been talking about this electoral offences com uh, commissions. Tribune? Oh, okay. Um, yeah. The act. bill is before... Yes, I think it's, it's before the, the stage National now. Assembly. Um, it's gone to, find, it's gone to uh, public hearing, I think, already. So it should be going back for final consideration. Okay. Um, w whether they're going to make progress with that, we don't know yet. But... Uh, flip to page four if you're truly interested in this story. Uh, but look at this one. El Rufai, Obaseki, Inua, others demand subsidy removal, restructuring. Okay? It, it is interesting because look at this. El mm. Rufai and Obaseki, they're both from different political parties, but mm -hmm. hey, they have one thing in common. They're governors. And, you know, there's anything we know about governors for the longest of times. They have been asking that subsidy be removed and this has not mattered what party they have belonged to mm. uh this has gone on for the longest of time so even now even under buhari's government this hasn't changed uh, page seven is where you find details i know the nnpc has been speaking um on that as well especially the the new the gmd is as well you know understanding that look as long as we have arbitrage you know what we're seeing with our subsidy regime is going to continue 2023, Abdul Salami Kuka raised concern over violent campaigns. That is also there as well for you. At the picture there with a thousand words, you see the Emir of Kano, Alaji Aminu Adobayero, uh, River State Governor, Nisam Wiki, his wife, and Justice Miri, Miri Odili and her husband, uh, inaugurating the Peter Odili Cancer and Cardiovascular Diagnostic Treatment Center in River State yesterday. You also have a number of other stories right there on top of the nameplate for speedy trial. PMB asks NAS to amend CCB CCT Act. Would they be able to achieve that before they finally wrap up? Page six is where you'll find details. Terrorism. Court of John's Canoes trial indefinitely. That is also there as well. Let's leave it there for leadership newspapers. And from leadership newspapers, let's turn our attention to the Nigerian Tribune. And it has quite some offerings this morning that will interest you. We'll start with the lead story, and it is captioned this way. Peter B knows he can't and won't win. That's ascribed to the governor of Anambra State, Soludo, and it's a page 22 read. But let's take a look at the rider. The game he is playing is the main reason he didn't return to APGA. The brutal truth is that there are two persons, parties seriously contesting for president. The rest is exciting drama. The current fleeting frenzy, if not checked, will cost Ndigo dearly four years. And I believe this is a response to um, the governor of Anambra State being carpeted for his erstwhile uh, reaction to, uh, uh, you know, criticism to the uh, presidential aspiration of the Labour Party candidate. And he has quite a lot to say in the missive that he has written to reply to his critics. Uh, and in fact, those who also said that uh, some people who went to attack his hometown in Anambra State uh, were, were gone down and he had something to do with that, you know, as you know, an evil agenda of some sorts. You know, but this is his response, and he has quite a lot to say, and you find uh, the response no awash in the mainstream media. No matter what else, this headline is, ouch. Ouch. Like. It hurts. <laughs> <laughs> Do you belong to the Labour Party? I'm just asking. I work 
I'm in the labor movement. The labor. <laughs> <laughs> but labor party, uh uh, uh, uh no uh, party whatsoever. That's reassuring. Let's go above the name, please, to do a check on some st other interesting stories. You'll find this one, um, you know, ascribed to the former military uh, 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 head of state. Peace accord under threat. Abdul Salami Kuka raise alarm. Say comments, action, actions by political actors disappointing. It's a page 23 read. Uh, this is a bit unsettling, but then again, if we went by, you know, the start of our conversation this morning, perhaps that should raise some hope, you know, about the electioneering season being devoid of, you know, anchor, rancor and, uh, you know, on, on seemly language. You know, everything Chamberlain said is captured in a particular picture I saw recently. I mean, it's a, it's, a, it's a cartoon, right? Two politicians, like the two gentlemen that we saw, were holding hands, you know, holding each other by the shoulder, smiling, and looking at their supporters who are in fisticuffs. It's just that cartoon playing out, as far as I'm concerned, that's what I see. And we should just wake up to the reality and smell the coffee. It mm -hmm. is, for them, it's a different ball game altogether. They are friends behind the scene they will always be friends and don't also forget none of these major candidates have said anything negative about each other each other yeah they whatever it is they say in public they probably have taken permission from each other probably have taken permission from i'm gonna yab you <laughs> behind the scene and behind then they come the out scene. and they say these things the media carries it and all and so well, just to add to the conversation, the two front runners captured in that video are longtime friends and political associates. So whoever wins, it's uh, you know a thing of benefit for the other. And then those who are uh, that one will be subjective on don't the forget, ground. They are, they are two different political parties, so be guided so that we don't come after you. Uh, well, <laughs> we'll find out eventually. But those on the ground, they shouldn't forget that they are always pawns in a game of chess played by the politicians. Mm. Just two more stories before we exit uh, the Nigerian Tribune. 23.7 million Nigerians in 26 states to be in food crisis between June and August 2023. Uh, that's a report and it's a page 12 read. Uh, we hope that uh, you know, this does not become reality. Uh, something from yesterday uh, in the papers was more reassuring about how Nigerians will not experience food crisis in 2023. And lastly, uh, Defence Headquarters declares 19 terrorists wanted, places 5 million bounty on each. That's, you find that on page 26. The Vanguard newspaper has this lead story that, um, I mean, it's been around since yesterday. Vanguard newspaper leads with this one, tourism. DHQ, that's Defence Headquarters, declares Bello Turji, Adu Aliero, 17 others wanted. Find the story on page 8. Offers 5 million naira reward for information leading to arrest of each terrorist. 5 million naira reward is too small. Ascribe to Cornel Stan Labo. <laughs> Did he convert it to dollars? I don't know. No, no. It's a if good you development. Consider the amount of work that will be done to get one of those terrorists. Uh, uh, okay. Five million naira will be small. Okay, well, it's a good development as elections approach, says ex DSS Director EGO for ACF, MBF, Welcome Development. NAF kill bandits with rockets in Kiduna. Hostage escape destroys terrorists' camps. Find all of that on page eight of the paper. On the lower part of the page, in, in the midst of all that you have, on the bottom left corner of the page, debt servicing likely to be higher by end of December. That's ascribed to the Debt Management Office DG. The story you'll find on page 36. Not good news, but hey, that's what you have. Quick one on Mr. and Mrs. Uh, the back page, of course, has sports. Sime out of Eagles, friendly with Portugal. Dessas replaces him. Find the details there. But Mr. and Mrs. Mrs. is toasting Mr. Come on, dear. Don't do this. I need the money urgently. Remember, you're the sunshine of my life. And Mr. holding a newspaper. I know. But there is a global climate change now. <laughs> so we have very little sun. <laughs> That's the bad guy newspaper today, guys. Yeah, take a look at Daily Trust next, then. <laughs> Interesting one. Uh, no, <laughs> it's on a narrow redesign. Grains prices crash days after record surge. 
rush for grains subsides in major markets dollar bounces sells at 770 forex volatility may reduce investments raise inflation extract to experts i mean it was having a free fall mm -hmm. and quite a number of people were so optimistic they thought oh yeah we're waiting let it keep going down just just let that force of gravity just hold on to the, the tail of that dollar and keep dragging it down but dollar bounces, sells at 770, the paper reports this morning. So there you go. Uh, while many still waiting for that uh, new Naira notes to, to hit their pockets, actually, mm -hmm. you know, to get a hold of it. So, What's the date we're looking at again? Uh, I'll have to double check on that one. But yeah, sooner rather than later. So um, make plans. I know. You ever ask, what plans do you think I want to make? You think I'm one of those that put, dug the hole and buried something? Okay. <laughs> but those are the only people that should be afraid, really. I mean, <laughs> you have so much Naira, you don't even know what to do with, or you have a whole warehouse full of Naira notes. I mean, is it's anybody unthinkable? Even the visuals I are so it's just nauseating to see those kind of scenarios. Yeah. And you think, are these actually human beings doing this? But Things happen and you just... I mean, it's you know, not food. You can't, any you can't eat it. it it's, well, it just shows you <laughs> what goes on in people's minds mm -hmm. when they do what they do. It's um, really sad. But that is Daily Trust today. Oh, uh, well, let us see. Uh, Daily Times now has this one for us. NES, Nigeria's exchange rate regime remains of concern. That's attributed to the vice president of Shibajo says urgent steps need to be taken to control inflation that story is right there federal government reiterates commitment to harmonize public workers salaries so you know that there's usually a disparity between well I do not know no, they may not just reach any conclusions <laughs> but I know that even within the ministry's departments and MD and uh, agencies, agencies there's yeah. usually some disparity. I mean, if you work at an agency, for instance, um, you know, so it is different from what you earn if you're a core civil servant. Mm. Now, I, I don't know if that is what they're talking about or whether they're trying to harmonize all public um, officers' salaries. Uh, by public officers, I mean even those who have uh, been elected into office. So, I don't take my word for it. Just go to the paper and see what Daily Times is talking about see yeah. you know which which cater of public officers they're talking about that the federal government wants to harmonize uh, their salaries but look at this budget defense house of reps frowns at dmo over 3.3 trillion naira domestic debt that story is on page two how huge decline in revenue forces federal government to borrow more for survival so just in case you're interested in the story page two um, of your Daily Times newspapers. You shouldn't let it be taken away from you this morning. <laughs> let's leave it there for the Daily Times. <laughs> and from the Daily Times newspapers, let's focus on the Nigerian News Direct and elites with, you know, that very protruding concern about the economy. And, that burdensome. Yes. And it's captioned this way, Nigeria's economy, debts, burden, exchange rate, other pressures trouble FG and the riders go this way as government eyes increase in revenue through productivity value addition and uh, well that's the way to go or Shibajo that's the VP laments Naira's exchange rate debt service to revenue ratio reps fume over 3.3 trillion Naira domestic debt 3.3 trillion naira domestic debt not to talk of uh foreign debt grill dmo as el rufai calls for discontinuity of subsidy regime of course that's been captioned captured earlier well even if you changed you know the colors of the naira to the most attractive more attractive than any other currency in the world as far as you know you still have that untamed love for exotic things where not producing as we ought to the naira will still you know be weakened against the dollar so moderating supply and the demand as called for by the vp well would we'll just go a little way not a long way uh you know, to check the free fall of the naira uh, let's 
do a check on some more stories before we exit Nigerian News Direct. Uh, there's this one above the nameplate. Uh, 2023, INEC must be on red alert in Oyo. That's a scribe to back in this campaign council. INEC must be on red alert in all states of the Federation. And the security agencies must be on alert as well with reports of attacks on INEC offices, INEC staff and all of that. Well, you can uh, <laughs> find more of that story uh, inside uh, Nigerian News Direct. The page is really blurred now and I can't quickly get through to it. And uh, lastly, Abiodun Commission's Aripo Journalist Estate Road in, um, you know, off Lagos Ibado Expressway. We need more of that zest on infrastructure development on Lagos Ibado Expressway. If you think about the need for alternative routes so that uh, that road can be bearable for commuters and travelers who ply that road every day. That's the Nigerian News Direct for you. The Guardian newspaper leads this morning also with something economy related. <coughs> Excuse me. Two 37 day medical trips. Despite Buhari's pledge to cut costs, presidential fleet racks up 64.15 billion naira. And uh, the riders, what Buhari's two 37 day medical trips cost taxpayers. Landing fuel parking charges go up over 1.1 billion naira. Experts lament capital flight lost. Experts lament capital flight lost to medical tourism. Find the details continue uh, on the front page, continues on page six of the paper this morning. And um, is this also on the, right under the, the nameplate at Mangada's? Make debate mandatory for presidential Cuba candidates, CNPP tells FG. Um, I thought you were going to say tells National Assembly because it has to be a law, right? And uh, under the at the bottom of the page, Afenife raises the alarm over kidnapping, burning of INEC offices in Southwest. That story is on page six. That's the Guardian newspaper this morning. And that's the much of the papers we can take this morning. Right after this break, we'll take on the first issue for the day. Please stay with us. Pervasive attacks during campaigns and rallies of political parties revived the debate on the capacity and operations of the Nigeria police force. In a no-holds-barred session at the State House 57th Ministerial Briefing, the Inspector General of Police addressed the most recent attack on the PDP presidential candidate's convoy. What happened in Borno had happened and the, the assessment uh, of the Post, uh, sorry, of the state public relations officer might not be completely uh, conclusive as he had reacted to, to, to what had happened very quickly. And I think we have a, a total team that uh, will assess what had actually happened and the extent of what had happened based on various presentation that is coming out from members of the public, from the APC, from the PDP, from the police. So you need to have 
uh, more more information to to come out with a clear picture of what had happened and also put measures to prevent such occurrence in future outings of, of, of the parties. According to him, there is no imminent threat to the FCT and the government has not dismissed any of the recent alerts as a mere alarm. A lot of efforts have been made, like you said, uh, uh, to those detention. And uh, yeah, actually arrests have been made for those who we, are, we believe are planning to commit crime in whatever form. And, uh, and uh, we have done that arrest and assert uh, when due, uh, those arrested will be charged to court by any of the services that have them. He acknowledges that the police has indeed commercialized some aspects of their duties. The Special Protection Unit, uh, the DIG is here, uh, was created to provide protection for VIPs. And uh, we feel uh, people are abusing it. But anybody that will be provided with that service uh, must be assessed, must be checked, uh, checked and processed. That is not one of those you have mentioned before such, uh, before such protection is provided. It is a commercial outfit of the police, yes. While promising to take cases of assault very serious, the Inspector General also assures that the release of the Chibok girls is still an ongoing situation that would require training of negotiators, among other strategies, to resolve. From the Presidential Villa, Gloria Umezuke, Channels Television News. Right, welcome back. So uh, that is where we are starting from this morning. The decision of the court in Uyo, the capital, where the election of uh, the governorship candidate of APC in Akwaibumse was nullified. The court did agree with Senator Itainang saying that um, the candidate was not qualified and not a member of the political party. So we'll be taking a look at some of those decisions and the legal position or perspective and implications of that, if you will. We've got uh, two gentlemen who will talk about that. But first, we have uh, Mr. Ajibulu. Actually, Tunda Ajibulu was the chairman of that Akwaibom APC primaries committee. So he presided over that uh, conduct of how uh, Akandofa emerged. So he joins us to shed light on what transpired. Good morning and thank you for joining us today on the program. Well, yes, you uh, definitely have heard about that uh, judgment. So could you then take us back to what transpired, uh, what your impression is of that judgment of the court? Uh, good morning. I hope you can hear me. Yes, um, go ahead. Good morning. Yeah, good morning, Nigeria. Um, always a pleasure to be on channels. Well, I must say, it wasn't like I was following the case, but um, when the judgment um, when the judgment came out yesterday, I mean, my phone started ringing, you know, because I mean, a lot of people remembered that um, I chaired um, the process. So speaking about the judgment, I must say, I must say that I'm... Um, Stunned, I'm shocked. Um, I, 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 I just don't get it uh, because um, I was the chairman of the Aqua Ibom APC 2022 gubernatorial uh, primaries. Primaries were conducted, and then the gentleman that um, was supposed to be here, Senator Thailand, also participated um, in the process. You know. And I must say, this um, primary has been fraught with, I don't know, there's just been so much interest in it, and I really don't understand. You know, it first started with the resident electoral commissioner that, um, you know, went on and on and on and on on TV, I mean, saying all sorts of things. I mean, this is the same um, resident electoral commissioner that called me and tried to convince me to come and conduct primaries in another venue. And he called me on the phone of the DSS director, you know? So it's on record. And I said to him, I said, I'm not sure when INEC started to decide venues to conduct primaries. 
that I have a mandate from my party, the All Progressive Congress, to come to Akwaibom and conduct primaries at the National Secretariat. And that is what um, I'm going to do. Anyway, that um, aside, um, I've not seen the court judgment, but I've um, seen it on social media. I've seen it on um, I've seen it on your on your TV. I've seen it on Arise. I've seen it on different platforms. So there's no smoke without fire. And the judgment is bizarre as far as I'm concerned, because I'm not sure, like the same way I told the resident electoral commissioner, that I don't understand when INEC will be deciding where a party will conduct primaries. I don't understand how a judge can determine <laughs> whether somebody is a member of a political party or not. When the political party in question says this person, this individual is a member of our party. This individual was screened, <laughs> you know. This individual was granted a waiver. Now, before all this even comes on board, for you to be a member of APC, you must go and register at your ward, your local government, your ward. So for if APC, if the All Progressive Congress says uh, Obong Akadimo Udofia, is a member of APC, and he contested the primaries, and his name has been sent to INEC, oh that he won the primaries. I am not sure where a judge will be able to come to say that Akanumo Udofia is not a member of APC. I mean, it's just bizarre to me. Uh, uh, Mr. Uh, Ajibulu, uh, in that same yeah. judgment so far, is that according to the judgment, I mean, the waiver you just talked about, for instance, um, what, the, what is being reported is that the judge said that the waiver given from the APC was not signed by, quote, any known persons. Could you tell us about that? Because one of the, the bases uh, for which the, the, uh, the judgment went was, look, this person, as you said, uh, wasn't a member of the party. You said that he's a member of the party and consequently got some waivers. But the basis of even going to court in the first place by the people who took the, the plaintiffs, I guess, was he wasn't a member of the party, having just perhaps recently come into the party and gotten these waivers that you talked about. So tell us about the process, because he joined Chamberlain. not shortly, Chamberlain. not can too, I, not, not can, too can long after, and then the primaries were conducted. Okay. Okay, can I ask you a question? How did he how did he contest the primaries? He just dropped from the sky. He just dropped from the sky, and then he's contesting APC gubernatorial primaries. He just dropped from the sky. He was screamed. He was cleared to contest. I wasn't a part of the process. My job as chairman of the uh, gubernatorial primaries was I have a list of aspirants, conduct an election, and announce the winner. So how even the senator, how Senator Ita Enang, how he became, how he, how he cleared his, um, how he was cleared, I don't know. How the other man, um, Odon Dege, I keep wondering his name. I don't know how he was cleared, you know. I was given a list of cleared primaries from the party headquarters, and I worked with um, that list. So it's not in my place to say what the process is, what the process is not. I was given a list of cleared and credible. Now, do not forget, in this same process, some people are screened out. They don't make the court. Uh, do you understand that? In, the, uh, in, other, in, in that same process. Yeah, you, you mentioned the other time that the resident electoral commissioner, you know, was trying to make a claim about the venue of the oh. of the primary. Oh, no, 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 no. I, I, will, I will unequivocally state it. He called me and he was trying to convince me. Okay, to but one of the, what Arena. he had said, yes. just a second, what he yeah. had said yeah. was, and I think this was reported on May 27 or thereabout, what he said mm. was, look, the the 
venue was perhaps the one that INEC was in, informed that that is that the event will hold at, that the primary will hold at, and that the state party executives were there and some other officials were there. The DSS person that he said was also there with him. So INEC was there. So many other people were there at that venue that I believe, I do not think that INEC would just wake up and say, this is the venue we're going to go and everyone else must go there. So how come there was a mix-up where the state exco of uh, Aquaibom was there uh, at that venue that the INEC official was, and then uh, you said that the event was holding somewhere else. Was there a venue change? Okay, so, oh, okay, so now you're taking me, you're going to take me back in uh, history. I mean, you're going to take me back to something, I mean, I, I've tried to block, something I've tried to forget. So the truth of the matter is, when we, when I and my committee, when we go to Aquaibom, we were held to ransom for over, for close to five hours. Um, the boss we were in was almost burnt. It took the intervention of the DSS to rescue us after over five hours, surrounded by hundreds and of some by whom trying to trying to trying to force us to go to a at a place called Shia Gris Arena, okay. which was the alternate venue. We were surrounded. It was a very traumatizing experience for me. Because as the chairman of the committee, the lives of the other committee members, I mean, was also, you know, was on my shoulders. You know, it took the intervention. Even, even the, even, I mean, like, different people, I mean, my phone was, you know, I mean, when I became chairman of the committee, my number was, so my number was on the internet. So almost every player, every player in Aquabam politics was calling my phone. Every major player was calling my phone. And I stood on one thing. I am going to conduct primaries in the recognized venue where the party said I was going to conduct, I should conduct the primaries, which was the APC secretariat, state secretariat okay. in Uyo. In then we were held ransom for over four and a half hours, five hours by thugs blocking us from going to the APC National Secretariat to conduct these primaries and trying to force us to come to the Shia Grace Arena. I have never heard of the Shia Grace Arena before in my life, you know? But I insisted I stood my ground. And with the intervention of the DSS, they rescued us and they moved us to the DSS um, headquarters for safety. I'm talking at this time, maybe, maybe, maybe 9.30 at night. Um, you understand? And it was while I was in the DSS office, different calls started coming through. Uh, do you understand? Um, Senator Duen there was one of the people that called me. In fact, Senator Itaina called me and he even came to meet me in the DSS director's office. Um, um, the INEC rec called the DSS director, you know? And, the DSS, and I spoke to him on the DSS director's phone. So that conversation must be recorded somewhere. And I state categorically, he tried to convince me to come to the Shia Grace Arena to conduct the elections. And he said to me as well, All that right. he will not recognize the election in the party, in the party secretariat. And I said to him, I'm not sure. I said, look, I'm traumatized. I've been through a lot. Left to me, I'm ready to go back to Abuja. But however, I have a mandate to conduct primaries from the APC. All right, Mr. Ajibolu, we, we, we do have uh, Senator Itayanan here with us, who you also have mentioned. Yeah, please. He is the APC yeah, governorship yes, yes, candidate, yes. as well as the former special advisor to the president on National Assembly and Niger Delta Affairs. He joins us here in the studio to respond to some of what you said. Good morning, Senator. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Today. Well, you, you heard uh, a lot of what he said uh, about the process, which the court did agree with you yeah. that uh, Akanadofia was not a member of the yeah. party and so notified the election yeah. asking that a fresh primary be conducted. Yeah. How do you respond to what he said first, perhaps? Let me thank him for at least the courage to appear to speak here because I thought that he will not have the courage to speak after what he did in Akwaibom. But I, I respect him. I, I am the plaintiff in the case. We are, and my claim before the court was that there was no governorship primaries in Akwaibom State. First, because 
INET did not monitor that primaries. And I stated this position immediately after the, the primaries was on 26th, on 26th. On 27th, I called a press conference myself and Austin took that look, it doesn't matter who will win in this case, but that this process we've done has not been monitored by INEC. So we sh the party should recall the, the, the panel headed by Mr. Jibulu back to Abuja so that, and then call or, or, or call everybody, let us agree first on the delegate list to be used and second on the venue to be, for the election to be conducted, third for INEC to monitor the election. First, INEC said, and they were right, that this, the delegate list you have, the delegate list they have, is the one that were emanated from the congresses that were conducted by the Austin-led executive. And that is the certified one. And that is the one that was to be used at the Eagle Square. That is why in the presidential primaries, Akwaibon State did not vote because of this dispute. Now, going back to the, um, going back to the uh, membership, the elections, screening was done, we bought form, and my brother and friend, Mr. Uh, Akanodofia, who is not a member of the APC, he bought the nomination form of the PDP, stood, nom stood screening in the PDP, was screened and cleared in the PDP. He was issued clearance certificate by the PDP to contest the pre presidential, the gubernatorial primaries of the PDP on the 25th. Now, on the, 20, on the 1st of May, while his clearance was still pending, and he was to, con 1st of May, and he was to contest the election on the 25th of May, which he actually conduct contested, he wrote a letter purporting to resign from APC on the 1st of May. On the 5th of I May... to resign from APC or PDP? I mean, he resigned from PDP mm -hmm. to join APC. On the 5th of May, he manufactured a, a concept that he has a, he's a member of APC. Now, he came on the 13th, or about the 7th or 8th of May, to buy the gubernatorial form. On the uh, 13th of May, he came for screening. And particularly on the 14th of May, he said he obtained a waiver, a waiver of the party to contest the election. Okay. Now, this is what we contended in court, that look, under the law, the act, mm -hmm. that you can only contest primaries of the party while the register, if you are a member of the party, mm -hmm. while the register of the members is still, register of membership is still open. And the electoral act provides that the register of members must be submitted to INEC 30 days to the primaries. So the court held that there, you, there, there was no, he's not a member of the party. Okay. Because on the 25th of May, preceding 26th, he had contested and lost the, pre, the gubernatorial primaries of PDP. 25th, the 25th, 25th of May. That is a day to the 26th of May which we held our own primaries. So he contested on 25th in PDP, had votes, and he contested, he came over okay. in, P, in APC so, the following day and contested. And so quite a board. number of things you raised, but first yes. of all, was there a change of venue eventually? Yes, no, no. Yes, there, there is a question of contest, I mean, um, contestation as to venue. There were two blocks in, in, in Akwaibon State, and of these two blocks, one of them belonged to the was that was led by the former national secretary of the party, my brother JJ Akwano Daidega, and um, the chairman is uh, Austin Ekanem. There's the other one that is led by um, I mean that is chaired by Ntuwekbo, you know, which uh, uh, there was a court judgment pronouncing that there is um, that Ntuwekbo is the state chairman. Now, the INEC said that. And they were right that the, I, the delegate list that we have, which is the one that we monitored the local government congress that produced the delegate, that voted the delegate to the uh, uh, state congresses, which we used in electing the state officers, you know, is the one they have.
that this other one that you have, you know, and you want to do that, is not recognized. Now, that, yes, there was a court judgment saying that the, they have recognized um, Ntugwekbo as the new chairman of the party. But there is an order of the Court of Appeal. There is an order of the Court of Appeal, which I also exhibited, that there was, that there was order of um, uh, um, status quo antebellum. That is, who let the status quo remain, an order of the Court of Appeal. Okay. Now, on the basis of that, this is, and the order of the court, high, federal high court, neither the order of the federal high court nor the order of the Court of Appeal annulled or had anything to do with the delegate list. And in fact, this thing played out exactly again in the Eagle Square at the presidential convention. And I said, okay. that is why we did not vote. And even in the primary that we're going out for God willing, we are going back for God willing, we must first agree that this is the appropriate delegate okay. list to be used. But part of what Mr. Ajibu said is yes. that the party granted him waiver. Yeah. And according to the laws, mm -hmm. both the Electoral Act and the Constitution, yeah. it is the party that submits the list of a candidate. Yeah. So they then question, how come the court is trying to dissent and determine who has the right to determine who is a member of the party? I agree with you to the extent that that was the law. I speak and I go to court as a lawyer, not just as a lawyer advocating, but also as, um, as a, a lawmaker. I was a principal party to the making of the Electoral Act 2003. I was chairman of Rules and Business Committee of the, of the House of Representatives. I was the, the principal party to the making of the Electoral Act 2010, which was repealed in 2022. I was advisor to the president on National Assembly Senate, which I, 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 I was a principal party to the issue that led to the, uh, all the issues that related to the Electoral Act, which has finally been assented to. The issue in then was that, is it, it is, it is the right of the party to file candidates, yes. And that was when it was said to be internal affairs of the party. But when we saw in the legislature and the decisions of the court that the, the parties were almost descending because of the brigandage by the leadership of the different parties as at that time, we now said, look, in the legislature, the legislature now said, let there be a level of decorum. And a few of the things that were in the in the uh, regulations and rules of the party were elevated into the Electoral Act. Now, the question of the Electoral Act says in Section 84.1 that every party, any, that the party, the, that the candidate must emanate from the convention of the, from the convention or Congress of the party, which must be monitored by INEC. So it is not a question of internal affairs of the party any longer. But it's still the party that will present the candidate. Yeah, no, no, no. If you can only pre yes, it is the party that will present the candidate. Mm -hmm. But in section 8413, 8413, the law says that where the uh, candidate does not emanate from a validly conducted primary, that INEC shall not accept the, the, uh, the nomination. The candidate of the, the party. Power to, has the power to reject Yes, the has the candidate. power to reject the candidate. So, but the, the, the thing is this, yes. you, you allege, you also make an allegation that, um, you know, you're surprised that Mr. Jibulu is here yeah. um, as chairman of that, of that particular primary. Yes. Um, why do you say so? Because according to him, he was only working with what the party gave him to work with. I agree, agree with him. But I agree with you. But I was a great party to the rescue of the team. But I, can I say, look, Akwai Boom is not known for this level of violence. Because when they came, they were blocked on the way. Mm -hmm. By and who? By a, a, um, a, a group of uh, persons who were dissatisfied one way or the other. And in fact, as I was briefed, I had to leave everything I did to intervene in an odd manner with the SSS and the police. I must, com I must compliment the SSS and the police and the leadership of the state party because everybody sank their differences. When the uh, gentlemen who attacked and blocked them opened the tank of the bus and wanted to use lighter to set fire on it. So everybody had to release every help they could 
so that the SSS came by every means to set fire on the bus with them inside, with the uh, Ajubulu and the, and the team inside. Because we were scared. These are fathers and parents and children of people, you know. So what we did was, look, let's rescue them to the SSS. SSS and the police rescued them, took them to the SSS headquarters. At 11 o'clock, 11.15, I went to meet him, at least to, uh, at least to empathize with them, make sure they are safe, make sure they were catered for... Not, not to influence the process? No, no, no. No, no, no. I, I didn't have any, any, any capacity to influence any process. They were in the office of the state director of, uh, director of state services, you know. Mm -hmm. So I went to him. Other people also went. Others put a call. Now, I now asked him, Mr. Jubulu. Now, as it is, when are we, are you likely to conduct the uh, primaries? He told me that he is too traumatized to think of conducting the primaries because they are still recovering from the trauma of escaping of, of, of life. Now, in the, the, in the course of it, in the presence of the state director of SSS, he said, but the, um, but the law says that if you don't conduct it today, it will last. I said, no, that the law is only interested in your filing candidate before the 4th of June. As at that time, I never said the 4th of June, you know, that this is the situation. And I, we discussed and left. I left with the understanding that, and I told him, look, let the, before you conduct these primaries, the primaries you're talking about, let the leaders meet, resolve some of the contentious issues, including the venue, including everything, including the delegate list. He seemed to have agreed with me. I left him at the SSS quarters and went back to my house. Precisely 17 minutes after I left Ajibulu at the state uh, at the DSS headquarters in Uyo, I was informed that he has he and his team have left to the uh, uh, venue to conduct election. In fact, I was standing uh, downstairs and attending and uh, meeting the uh, one of the uh, panel members, a colleague, a, a, a colleague in the Senate who came for the um, uh, House of Reps primaries. You know, which was also all of them came in the same plane. And I saw him go out. So I was thinking that he was going out to meet the, to the police because he was with the SSS now to consult about uh, the, when he's going to hold the primaries. And I left after that only to be told 17 minutes. And I, I keep repeating 17 minutes after I left. I got home. I was told he is at the venue starting the process of the primaries. So what did he do wrong? So, yeah. So I now said, oh, no, it can't be there. That he, I left him, he said he was going to the police, only to find out. I went there. I found him distributing ballot papers to uh, people, unidentified people to vote. This was about 12, past 12, 1 a.m. in the night. I now asked him, Mr. Jibo, chairman, where is the delegate list? He said he did not come with the delegate list. Okay, I asked him again, where is INEC here? He looked around, he said, I he said, it's not my business, I came to conduct primaries. So I sat for about 15, 10 to 12 minutes, discussed with the state chairman, um, Mr. Ntwekbo, and I, I stood up and said, look, the kind of this process, the entirety of it is a nullity. And I walked away, and I walked away. Other, other Where was this? Was this, not... was this at the secretariat of your party? At the state secretariat of the, the... party, okay. you know, according to the judgment of the high court, which recognized into work both. But the primaries and the delegate list, because why I asked him of the delegate list was to find out where, where, which of the list are you using? Is it the list that was produced by the... Um, uh, I make monitor uh, uh, primaries, I mean, uh, yes, of the I make monitor congresses of the local government of the w local gov of the state of the world and at the state. Mm -hmm. He said okay. he didn't come with it. All and right. he was just tearing papers to people anyhow. All mm -hmm. right, let, let's uh, have him. Mr. Jibulu, so could you tell us then, is this how things play down? Well, um, Senator Italian and um, there's um, spoken. Mm -hmm. And then uh, some of what he has said, well, I have to concur with. But then I must say that uh, maybe, um, you know, maybe his memory has failed him a bit. 
um, that he does not recollect in entirety um, what actually happened. So first things first, um, point of correction for Mr. Enang. I left him in the DSS director's office. I went to conduct primaries. I left him there. He was still with the DSS director when I left. Um, you know, uh, that's one. And then before even all that, I mean, he's a lawyer. So he puts me at a disadvantage. He can quote this, quote that, quote this, quote that. I'm a tax consultant and I, I'm in politics. I stand on certain things that I know. I don't understand gray areas. Is one, pl one plus one cannot be three. A waiver normally is total in whatever circumstances. That is what the word means, waiver, waiver. It means certain things have been waived aside, uh, you know. And INEC recognized only one ex school. Do you understand? And that, that gave me the, uh, and INEC could recognize the party. And the party, I'm, I'm happy he accepted that. And the party gave me a mandate to come and uh, conduct primaries. Now, he said at the primaries, he said he stayed for 10 or 15 minutes. I beg to differ. Um, he's a gentleman. I beg to differ. He said he was, at the he was at the venue of the primaries for over one hour. And he came, he was shown the delegate list, and he sat down. He said, I was distributing. I have committee members. You know, I was the chairman. I had committee members. He came, he shook my hand. He sat down. He was there for at least an hour. At least one hour. I repeat, and, you know, he keeps saying, he's saying 17 minutes. I'm saying one hour minimum. It was at the primary, it was the venue, of, and then there are videos to corroborate this. There are videos, there are pictures of him being shown the delegate list. You know, I know nothing about Akwaibon politics. I came from national. So you can't involve me in your village squabbles. You know, I work with what the party gives to me. And I will put the party above and beyond any individual. Um, you know, so he sat down. He was there for over an hour. And he stood up. He took the microphone. And he said um, he, he, had a, um, he had a complaint. And he spoke. All this is documented. It is recorded. It, is, it was on TV. You know? And he, and, he, and he made his, um, you know, whatever. He, he said he was not satisfied with the process, uh, blah, blah, blah. And I said, noted. He went, sat down for another five minutes and stood up and he left the venue. So he came coming to say he came to the pro, he, he came there, he stayed for uh, five minutes, uh, he complained about um, anomalies and he left. I, I beg to differ with that. I put it and I categorically state Senator Ita Enang was at the venue of the primaries for minimum of an hour. After which, and when he came, he asked for the delegate list. They showed him. He discussed some things with the party chairman. I don't know whatever was discussed. And, but um, the committee proceeded in sharing ballot papers. And he sat down. So uh, for me, I'm not a lawyer, so I can't razzle, dazzle you. But then um, if you come, if you ask for, if you ask for delegate list, they, they show you the delegate list, and you go back and sit down. To me, it's a tacit approval. It's a tacit you're satisfied. And he was there. After about an hour, he stood up, asked for the microphone, and he said there are a lot of irregularities happening here, and he's uh, protesting. And when he finished, I said, noted. He sat down again for another, and him and a couple of other aspirants, they left. And we, and, we, and we conducted primaries. And another point, you see, in the heat of the moment, we miss, we miss out on a lot of things. The timing was way before 12 midnight. He has to, uh, he has to, he didn't come at 1 a.m. Way before midnight. The process started way before midnight. You know? So, uh, that's all I have to say for now until I hear whatever. Um, all right, Senate, Senator, Senator has to say, and I have to rebuke. So, Senator Enang. Senator Inanga, I imagine you would want to respond to, you know, all of the, these things that uh, Mr. Ajibolo has just said, particularly about him having the delegates list and you were shown. Uh, as you respond to that, I'd also like you to clarify uh, the phone call he also referred to that he had with the resident electoral commissioner who was prevailing on him to 
um, you know, come to the Sheer Grace Arena for the primary that will be conducted there rather than that of the, uh, that conducted at the uh, headquarters of the party in Akwa Ibom State. Uh, is that quite um, acceptable within the confines of what the role of the uh, commission should be in terms of, you know, neutrality and uh, uh, attending or monitoring primaries acceptable uh, uh, to INEC upon invitation by the political party. Thank you very much. But please, come, before coming to that, let me talk about um, the question of waiver that he has raised. Why I, I, I said at the beginning that I was a party to the making of all the Electoral Act, 2003, 2011, and um, 2000, and, um, and the uh, one that culminated in the 2022. And it was when we saw that there the, were a lot of irregularities in party activities, that is why the question of practice of the electoral parties, of the parties, was elevated into the Electoral Act. And the Electoral Act provided what you have to do to... If the process is internal to the party, you can waive it, if it is exclusively internal to the party. But the law is that if it is the provisions of the statute, the party of the law, the party cannot waive it. The party cannot waive it. So there can be no waiver. So if the party says you must be a member of the party so before you become, uh, uh, before you are qualified to vie, then you have to, and that cannot be waived by the party. And of course, what the... the um, the purported waiver he produced, which the court examined, it was not signed by anybody, was not, uh, was not signed by anybody, did not bear anybody's name, and was not in any manner uh, known as to who originated it. So a lot of things were all fake, and we exhibited all this. Now, on the question of who, whether INEC is, should determine the venue of the, INEC cannot determine, and INEC in this case did not determine. Now, I next said, the delegate list we have is here. One. Two, I have received the notification as to the venue. You know, these were the correspondences. All other issues which are I next specific, I am not privy to it. I, have, I did not know what they discussed there. All I know was that that evening, that evening, a video was circulating where the, chair, the um, commissioner of police in the company of the uh, independent of, of the uh, INEC commissioner, Mr. Mike Egini, addressed the delegates who were in the list that they had at the venue called Share Grace, which was more, um, led by Mr. Austin Utuk. He addressed them at that venue. And in that video, he said that the, the uh, panel members are held up at the, uh, at the SSS that they were rescued after the trauma. That was about 10, 30, 11. That was when, and then he now, um, he now, the INEC and the Commissioner of Police now declared at that venue that this um, uh, Congress is postponed and they will be informed, and the party will inform them as to when it will be conducted. And that is what INEC wrote in their report, that the Congress did not hold, and that the chairman of the panel, Mr. Jibulu, informed him that they are too traumatized and will inform him when they, were, when they will conduct the primaries again. That is the video that showing what INEC commissioner, with the commissioner of police, addressed the uh, delegate and said, and so the people went back home believing that the Congress had been postponed. And that was why the following day, and in their report, they said that, I next said that they will be informed, when they are informed of the next date for the holding of the Congress, they will be there. Of, you know, yeah, of, the, of the primaries, they will be there. And the people dispersed. That video came out at about 11 o'clock. That was even before I went to the uh, DSS headquarters. Yes, my friend had said that he left me at the DSS headquarters. The DSS office in which I was with him was in the, in the office of the state director upstairs. I finished with the, the state director and himself. I came downstairs, was still chatting with the distinguished colleague of mine, 
and while he when he came out with a, when he came out and entered a car of one of the aspirants, I mean of one of the persons, I, I apologize for this, of entered a car, and I thought they were going to the commissioner of police, who was not here, being a security that he has briefed the, the, the SSS, the DSS here, he may be going to brief the commissioner of police because he told me he was too traumatized to hold the, conven the uh, Congress. I'm just... And of course, please let me add this too, mm -hmm. that let my brother confirm and um, I, the, 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 uh, your other colleague and the anchoring on the other side, she asked that if it is the duty of SSS to determine the venue or something. I said, no, it is the party. But the party will have to, to, to um, inform INEC. Like what we did at the, at the Eagle Square, the, the, um, the um, confirmation of the delegate was done at the International Conference Center. When you go for the, for, uh, to show you that you are a delegate, INEC will be there to show that you are a delegate in the list that the, from the co uh, Congress they monitored from the states. And so INEC was there throughout the process after, of the uh, accreditation at the International Conference Center. And after that, INEC was also there at the, uh, INEC was also there at the Eagle Square. And the names of the INEC officers were announced representing the chairman of INEC at the, at the, at the, at the, at the Eagle Square, where we did the uh, presidential primaries. So this is a standard practice known to law and in compliance with the law as it were. I just want to okay. confirm, I don't know if Bukis still has any more questions, but I want to confirm from you where you think this now leaves your party. Mm. Uh, and a fresh primary has been ordered in 14 yeah. days, but yeah. looking at what is currently happening, there's certainly a rancor. Uh, so one, one, one will wonder if INEC will still be able to take the names from the primaries conducted by your party in 14 days, uh, since names have already been shown. INEC is in a, is in a whole different process right now. So whether INEC will still be able to accept the names, one, and then two, whether your party will still be able to pull together, uh, because this certainly has implications for the unity within the APC in Akwaibo. Incidentally, the APC is one family in Akwaibo. It's one, but one is, APC is closely knitted, but it's only a question of these different interests. That's number one. Number two, as of today, because INEC did not monitor this problem, because a lot of irregularities, and because of Section uh, 84 1 and 84 13, Mm -hmm. The INEC, I mean, APC, Akwaibom, is the only party in the entire country, the only state that APC has no candidate. So it's not a question that somebody is a candidate and is removed. No. Mm -hmm. APC, there is, when you look at the, uh, the, the box of APC in the uh, INEC, just Google it now, you will see that it is blank. The governorship, deputy, it is blank. So we don't have a candidate. So it is this suit of, of mine, it is this action of mine, which has given the party a window mm. to uh, now conduct primaries yeah. and... Uh, but Senator, there are questions as, to, yes, questions as to this window. Because, I mean, yes, we see the conditions upon which um, a candidate or a political party may present a new list, conduct fresh primaries, giving 14 days notice and the likes. But there are those who question the legality of giving the party, the APC in Aquabum State, a second bite at the cherry because they thought if you missed out, if you did not remit the required process, you lost it. So now they wonder upon what proceedings or law, either from the electorate or otherwise, did the judge rely on to grant the party 14 days or a fresh the, primary? The, 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 the law, I think it's section 84 14 says that if you are dissatisfied with any of these processes, you can approach the court of law. And when you approach the court of law, the court of law is, makes an order. Then you are, you, it is now said court ordered. So the court has inherent jurisdiction and in a jurisdiction under the act. Since it says that a party dissatisfied can approach the court. When you approach the court, you are entitled to a relief. And that relief can then give you an opportunity to present a candidate and be on the ballot. So, as of today, APC is not on the gubernatorial ballot in a Kwaibom state. So, nobody's name is there. Yet, the party 
believing that it had a right. And uh, somehow it can um, send name, emanating from its process, sends a name. But the INEC, in accordance with the law it's, it has, has said this process is not known to law and under section 84.1, 39, and of course 29, and other sections, you don't have a candidate. And more so, INEC had said in their written report, which was submitted on the 30th, that we are still waiting for APC to give a date for another, uh, for Congress. And on the 28th of this, on the 27th, I called a press conference myself and Austin, stating the position that as it is now, we are not likely to have a candidate. That is 28th of May. On 20, that is 27th of May. On 29th and 28th of May, I wrote a letter to the party, the party executive, that please, let us call back the panel. Let us call the parties and agree on a process, agree on the list, so that we can have a congress, a co um, um, congress that we can have a candidate that can stand for us. And on the 20th, 30th, I wrote another letter. I did, was not even see, I did not even see the report of INEC, and I stated the position of the law known to me. On the 9th of May, you know, I mean, on the about 5th of June, I wrote another letter, still stating the position of the law to the party, you know. In fact, there is a name, the party, the party headquarters, you know, mm -hmm. sees me and has all my correspondences. And when I come, they sympathize with the situation. But they know that they were, that, that when they look. But, you know, it's a party, I'm loyal to it, and I'm bound by it, and I've shown respect right. to the party in all this thing and in all particulars, and I did not attack the party because I know the party is a party. We put it together, and I'm a member, and we are bound by the party. But I know that the law allows them, the party, to uh, conduct primaries now, and I believe that uh, I'm conscious, I'm, I'm, I'm hopeful that primaries will be conducted in 14 days. All right, we'll and just I will win and become the candidate of the party. We'll just go on a quick break, and we'll come back and get the closing thoughts of both gentlemen. Please join us again. Welcome back. Well, it's our concluding moments now, and we'll do that as soon as we can. So, Mr. Ajibu will tell us as we wind down on this one. Now that this order is here, we have to, it has to be obeyed. So how are you or the party planning to approach this? Would you be willing to go back and conduct another one? Of course. So I'm not here to defend anybody or, you know, or project anybody. My issue was I conducted primaries, and I conducted legit primaries for the APC. Again, I stand. When we talk, we should be, you know, we should be very objective. Only a madman will go to court, you know, with a waiver that is not signed by anybody. It must have been signed by somebody, uh, you know. And then said it to Enang, I'm happy he didn't dispute most of the things I said. Again, he has to understand, he's saying, there's a window. Who is he to give our party a window? He knows better than he knows better than the party. For me, the party is supreme. How can the party be happy with him? No, I, I, I think he meant that say, the court has provided the opportunity, the window for the party. To no, have he said. He, no, he said. We'll, we'll he said. Go ahead no, 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 no. He said he was responsible for it. He said he was responsible. The process he initiated has resulted in this. You know, and then he was saying some other things um, earlier on. I'm sorry, I went off for a while, so I couldn't um, respond. I, I, I reconnected. He said something about them when we were um, when we were blocked and surrounded by hundreds of thugs. How come we are held for over four or five hours, surrounded by hundreds of thugs, and the police commissioner and the INEC rec are in a venue and they are comfortable being there? That's a poser for all to mm. think about. Okay. Well, at the end of... All right. I'm just... Um, to, to just yeah, pardon me. We, well, we, 
Yeah. Go ahead and wrap yeah. up, please. Sorry, to just, uh, yeah, to just round up, um, I wish uh, Senator Ta Enanguel, um, and, I, and, I, and, I, and, I, and I would like to see where this uh, path would, um, would, would take him, going against the party. You cannot go against the party and um, get something. I, I wish right. him all the best. Thank you. Okay, well, Senator, just before you proceed, I'm, I'm trying to look for what parts of the law, the electoral act, did you yeah, you referred to when you said that uh, uh, the, the courts, if anybody felt aggrieved, they can approach the court and then the courts can rely on that to order this second bite of the cherry, the man of speaking. I think, I think Section 8414, or, or, or so, but that is, is, is there in the law, is there in the electoral act that you have to approach the court? It is, or, or, it, it is on the basis of that that people have gone to court, you know? that if you are satisfied with the process. And of course, it is under the, it is constitutional. It is inconstitutional, you know, you can. But, and, but it only, the only thing is that it limits you to the federal high court, you know, but that is, that, that, that is it. On the, in responding to my friend and brother, Mr. Mm. Ajibulu, he is um, a member of our party, and there is an extent to which I can't um, uh, go with him. And uh, because finally we are all still going to stand on the same podium to market our presidential candidate, gubernatorial candidate, and he will market me as the candidate of the party, God willing, and the and uh, by the grace of the party. So I will not respond to him in the same low language that he has addressed some of the issues. But I thank him, and I I, I thank him, and I really thank God that that we 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 came out of the issues uh, uh, everybody alive. And I won't respond to all other issues because they may not be relevant to today. And it's not possible to respond to all the issues within the short time here. Yeah. And all of right. course, if I need to respond to some of the issues, I may go low, but I don't, I, I must maintain my standing. Well, Senator Itainai is the APC governorship aspirant for Akwai Bom State and former special advisor to the president on National Assembly and Niger Delta Affairs. We have also had Mr. Tunde Ajibulu, who was the chairman of that APC governorship primaries conducted in Akwai Bom State. Gentlemen, thank you very much indeed for your time today. Anytime. Thank you. Right, we will be back in just a moment. Stay with us. All right, welcome back. Well, yes, uh, we're going to be focusing on uh, the need, the urgent need, uh, the utmost importance of ensuring that we conduct peaceful campaigns, the election process, and ultimately the elections. And so we do have Most Reverend Matthew Cooker joining us this morning. He's the convener of the National Peace Committee. Good morning, sir. Thank you for joining us today on the program. Good morning, Chamberlain, and thank you very much for having me. Yeah, so we, we have seen uh, this statement that was released, but yes, uh, responding to some of the narratives, the actions of political parties, uh, candidates, uh, some supporters as well. And of course, the National Peace Committee frowns against some of these actions. But how much of a challenge is this, especially when you see the perspectives of state governments, some of who have issued certain laws that their opponents don't comply with. Is it, um, I mean, how does the committee see this? Is it irredeemable or that, look, we need to arrest this as soon as possible? Well, well thank you very much. Um, as you can see in the wording of the statement, uh, it really just amplified the concerns of not only Nigerians, but also the international community. You know, a lot of uh, all this is happening against the backdrop of a very volatile environment captured by the expressions of concern by the international community. You know, and one would expect that Nigerians and the politicians, the political class, principally those who are going to be the beneficiaries of all the sufferings and all the pains that ordinary Nigerians are bearing on their behalf, that they will conduct themselves in a way or manner that is in keeping not only with the principles of the peace accord, but even just basic decency among us as individuals, you know, setting tenets that are already taken for granted, you know, as being the basis for which every game is, you know, is, is contested. So we, I think that we've just amplified the concerns of Nigerians, you know, indeed, 
In all of this, I think the governors, more than any other category of Nigerians, should be held almost fairly and squarely responsible for the behavior and the conducts uh, and the things that happen around the, the environment under which they have control. Because it is the reaction of state uh, agents, for example, whether it is in denying opposition access to facilities uh, and so on. And so these are some of the things that are generating the tension. So we just hope that as we speak on behalf of ordinary Nigerians, that the political elite will take us sufficiently seriously because it is in their interest to conduct themselves in a way or manner that is in keeping with the principles of democracy. Apart from the action of the governors, uh, and, and some of them will argue, you know, that we haven't exactly deprived. They've only said, okay, we're trying to protect infrastructure in our state. And that's why we have said they shouldn't use public uh, primary schools, uh, some of the arguments that we have heard. Uh, apart from that, uh, what other aspects give you concern, which you think point to intolerance? Look, you know, under the military, uh, the apparatus of state were largely compromised. You know, in the sense that almost everything was deployed to maintain the person who was in power. Um, and the essence of democracy is the expansion of the public space. And the whole idea uh, why democracy is what it is, and I have said it severally, we didn't elect people just because we want roads and so on. We elected people so that they, 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 they can help expand the frontiers of our collective freedom. Now, I happily, you know, if you remember, and if I may just, if you may just indulge me to put all this in context, you remember that in the run up to the 2015 elections, one of the very worrying things was the statement credited to the then uh, General Buhari, who, who was, you know, contesting for the, you know, for the elections, who had said something to the effect of what was said in Hausa, Karejini, Bini, Birejini, meaning that he framed, you know, the contest in a way and manner that literally translated, there will be blood for the monkey and there will be blood for the dog, meaning that this was a fight to finish. Now, that was, those were the anxieties and the tensions that led to the need for, for setting up of the peace committee. Now, if you fast forward, I think the most unfortunate thing is that we haven't made much progress, largely because of the nature of the political environment. There are people jumping from one political party to the other, you hardly have had a situation in which one, one presidential candidate has not contested in less than two or three platforms. So there's almost a lack of discipline and cohesion in the political infrastructure. So I think that the issues that are of concern to us is that the actors are not learning the lesson that they ought to learn. Um, and this is this volatility is largely what is playing out, you know, in the in the in the behavior of ordinary people. Today, a, a candidate decides to switch to a party and literally compels psychologically his people to switch you know, to, to the rival party. And a lot of these things are what it, they are the ones producing the ingredients for the violence that we are seeing you know, among ourselves. And of course, I remember in 2015, my good friend, uh, the very gentle Jodo Yegun, who was then chairman of the APC, how much lamentation they brought you know, to us over the way the elections were you know, being conducted. And the fact that they were afraid they would not be able to uh, have the space to contest. They won the election. The shoe was on the other foot. All the accusations that were made by the APC against the PDP, the, the PDP was now reproducing basically the same thing. So clearly it is that there, there are many people, for example, who have approached the peace committee on the ground that look, we have been denied a place to conduct our, our, our campaigns. Now, the same people are repeating basically the same mistakes. So this obsession with the monopoly of the infrastructure of power, it's not acceptable. So the country belongs to all of us, and nobody is less a citizen simply because they're in the opposition. So essentially, it is the, the need to create a level playing field. This is what is producing all this violence that you're seeing. All right, I think my colleagues in Lagos have got questions for you, Bishop. Go ahead, guys. Uh, thank you, uh, Chamberlain. Uh, so one issue uh, we raised earlier before just about the time we we're beginning the question the, the program today is concerning the two leading candidates of the, uh, the the ruling party and the main opposition party the pdp both of them were seen together um literally just greeting each other you know talking gisting and all of that um i wonder what you what, what your thoughts are 
on that, I'm pretty sure that you probably have heard about it or seen the video as well. What your thoughts are on that and if it has any communication whatsoever to the lower rung of the ladder in, their, in both political parties? That's, that's, a, that's, a, that's an excellent uh, uh, question. Uh, but it also speaks to the need for ordinary Nigerians to learn their lesson. You know, as a priest, uh, you know, it took me time to learn that when you go to settle a quarrel between a husband and a wife, you need to be a bit more modest and restrained because after the problems have been settled, you will not be there. But they will be the ones who will be saying, ah, father seems to have taken our case far more seriously than we took it. So the point I'm making is that, look, these politicians are struggling and they've lived their life, they're struggling for the national kick which they will distribute among themselves, all right? It is therefore in the interest of ordinary Nigerians to know that you have to vote to stay alive. Because I remember when President Buhari was elected here, yeah, about nine young people killed themselves in excitement and so on. They are no longer alive to enjoy the benefits of the victory. So what all this suggests to you is that when we as spectators, let me put it that we must understand that these politicians know themselves. The fact that they are shouting a lot of the grandstanding is actually just sending a message to, to the audience. It's left for you to appreciate the fact that, look, we are just posturing. We are, it's not as serious as you think. So the fact that politicians are shaking hands and having all this banter and flying all over the place. And they, you know, when they are having their celebration parties elsewhere, you will not be there. So it is just important for us to be a bit more restrained and wise, you know, that. As I tell my friends who support football clubs, don't go and kill yourself. Even if they win the cup, you will not see it. You will not touch it. So it speaks to the fact that we ordinary people must figure out how to manage our passions when it comes to politics. So don't take seriously the grand standard of the politicians. All the things you see about them abusing themselves or quarreling, you will think they will never shake hands. They're very good friends. And many of them have, they drink from the same pool. So don't, don't go and kill yourself for nothing. That is what that message is, you know, is all about. It's a very compelling thought. Uh, I'd like to follow up with um, uh, Malpe's question, uh, which is uh, related. Reports from political parties, particularly opposition parties in state of the federation, is that uh, there's uh, intolerance to the extent that uh, uh, the agencies do not allow them to put up their own adverts, uh, they don't allow them to use certain venues, um, and, uh, you know, the atmosphere for electioneering and campaigning is stifling. Is there some form of, you know, moral situation uh, at the level of uh, the Peace Committee where, uh, you know, conversations are held to prevail on uh, ruling parties in states to encourage a more level playing field for uh, uh, participation? You know, it's, it's quite disheartening. It's quite disheartening, you know, the way these people, they, the big people will pretend that they are not responsible for their supporters tearing the, 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 the posters of the opposition. But their body language often sends the message. I think that what we probably need to do, and a lot of civil society organizations are doing extremely well, is to figure out how to subvert this whole process, either by publicly calling attention to, to these irresponsible actions, or all in, in which case, using the social media, it should be possible for, 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 for men, victims of this whole you know, ex excess of the state to find a way of making, of making their, their case. It's not enough to appeal to the Peace Committee. The Peace Committee is not, is not I mean, we're, we're, not, we're not a tribunal, you know, we're not a court, um, and we have only moral suasion. But people must, I don't want to say, use the word, take the law into their hands, but we must also have a way of reporting this malfeasance because it is totally unacceptable. And like I said, I don't want to name names, but I know politicians who appealed to the Peace Committee not too long ago, and who were asking for support and for help because they were crying for basically the same thing, you know, that they are now inflicting on their people. And the easy thing is for the governor or for the leader of the party to pretend that they don't know this. If you read out the, the riot act and tell your people that this is unacceptable, they will act accordingly. But I think on the side of the ordinary people, I think what we can actually do is to change this argument that we should now realize that a political party that is already sending out negative signals, okay, 
whether they are tearing posters or allowing their supporters to harass people, they are already advertising their, 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 you know, their moral weaknesses. And they are already telling you that if they become president, if they become governor, this is what you are going to face. So the lesson for all of us is any party that is involved in this kind of activity is already sending out the wrong signal that the candidates do not qualify to be elected. And the, 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 the only thing a politician, I mean, an ordinary citizen can do is to punish through the ballot actions of this nature. Bishop, just one more question, and permit me to digress a little, but it's related to the conversation. I know that your calling has more to do with the intellectual aspect of uh, ministry, but you know, one cannot ignore um, you know, certain statements in recent times attributed to one of your colleagues uh, in Christendom that perhaps that, uh, you know, there's no clear message about whether or not the 2023 elections will, will hold. Uh, does this worry you, and does it have to do with, uh, you know, the polity being heated and, uh, you know, any uncertainty this has attached to the 2023 election? Look, you know, my dear sister, some of us have gone to school, and the reason why we went to school is to cure ourselves of, 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 of the forces of darkness. You know, the very fact that Nigerians at the highest level take some of these characters very seriously, so just very clearly that even they themselves, with their education, with their knowledge, with their going to church, with their going to Mecca and going to Jerusalem, where they are, we are still at best in moments of anxiety and fear, literally pagans. So anybody who wants to cast their, their fortune on the fact that some dubious prophet has told you that you are going to win election or lose election, you are going to live or die, you know, it's, it's pathetic. You know, that Nigerians even want to introduce this kind of thing into our political calculations. So I, I you know, for me, I mean, there's, there's a man who was uh, always prophesying what was going to happen at the beginning of every year. Um, and I, it was strange because he made the prophecy, but he did not even foresee the fact that his wife was going to die. He couldn't make that prophecy. So people who have indulged in this are actually suggesting very clearly that they, are, they probably may have gone to school, but they are not educated. They probably go to church or go to the mosque, but they have no sense of faith. So for me, elections are not going to be conducted in, you know, outside Nigeria. They'll be conducted here. And nobody except God has an idea about what the future is, is going to be. So I think my, my, my position and my suggestion is you want to vote, go out, prepare to vote, prepare to have a president, whatever the case may be. Well, one, Why am I not, you know, take too seriously predictions, prophetic predictions, as the case might be? Uh, what about that of the National Security Advisor who has been talking about, um, you know, people trying to disrupt the 2023 elections? Uh, there have been clear, uh, will I say, concerns about security and its implications for the 2023 elections. There are many places in this country we know activities uh, from 7 p.m. or from 5 p.m., between 5 and 6 p.m., people are already scrambling to quickly get to their homes. And after a certain time, you know, they leave the arena to bandits and, and other people who, you know, who have the temerity to be out by that time of the night or by that time of the evening. Uh, these are real situations that many Nigerians are currently living in. Do you fear... Uh, that these sort of situations could have any influence whatsoever on the 2023 elections? Well, you know, as the captain will say to the co-pilot, I got it. It's, I mean, we cannot surrender, you know, our, 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 our security to certain projections. I, when, when the border was killed here in Sokoto, I, I was coming from a funeral of the father of one of my priests, and I ended up in Abuja. And a lot of people say to me, you can't go back to Sokoto now. Give yourself one month, give yourself two months. I said, well, I'm Bishop of Sokoto. I don't have a house in Abuja. Whose house will I be living in for a period of one month? In any case, what kind of signal will I be sending you know, to, to, to the people under my care? I got into the plane and I came back to Sokoto. Um, on a daily basis, people are saying to you, you can't move this way, you can't do... My position is very simple in this matter. My life is in the hands of God. 
Um, I think that I didn't hear what the National <laughs> Security Advisor had. But those into whose hands the security of our country has been entrusted cannot be involved in scaremongering. Their responsibility from presidency right down is to let Nigerians know we've got your backs covered. Everything is, is you know, everything is going to be fine. And if, so if you don't send out those kind of signals, and security agencies are like the rest of us, throwing up their hands helplessly, there might be crisis, there might be violence in Nigeria. Governance doesn't work like that. Everywhere in the world is vulnerable. It, and this is what leadership is all about. In moments of crisis, leaders must step forward and stand forward and let their, those who are behind them understand that things are possible. I mean, I was here in Sokoto, for example, when, when my, my, my priests were kidnapped in Katsina. And we had a big debate. My priest was saying, no, you can't go to Katsina. I said, no, we have to drive to go and support our people. I went and came back. For me, you know, a roof could fall over my head. So I'm not, I, it's not as if I don't want to protect my life. But I think Nigerian citizens must be convinced and must be told in no unclear terms that they are being protected. God is the ultimate protector. But as I said, if you have, you know, the, the, the operators of the of national security helping in you know in scaring us so to say uh, it will do us no good because uh, what would happen is that people could just keep us permanently in this state of volatility and we are not able to 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 you could have all the the, the fine arrangements for the elections and suddenly people are being told oh this is what is going to happen so I think uh, there are areas of concern but there, there are concerns everywhere in the world. Now, I mean, while that peace accord was being signed, I remember several people who were saying that, well, this should be, they were, you know, hugely optimistic, especially when they thought no retired general is contesting this one, these are all supposed to be Democrats, and so it, it should be a lot smoother. But now, so early in the day, we're talking about this kind of scenario. But for you, is this, do you feel a lot more burden and responsibility having seen how this is already playing out so far? And is it something that at the end of the day, the committee may just sit back and review the strategies and see what more can we add to ensure that it takes a lot more effect and rooting the essence of signing this peace accord? Well, you know, for a long time when... Uh... Brazil and other countries assumed that people were coming to the World Cup just to watch them and accompany them. And Nigerians would turn up at international events and say, well, you know, victory is not important. It's participation that is important. But as the game has, as people have gained more and more experience with uh, Cameroon defeating Argentina, it seems now clear that, the, you know, the coast is open. So what I'm saying in effect is that Metaphorically, the participation of the generals, because they came from a tradition that monopolized power and, and closed the political space, it is natural that by opening up the political space, what we really see is not, it's not necessarily a bad thing if it doesn't cost human blood and human lives. Uh, the excitement, the energy, the passion, all these things are necessary. It, it, it's the same thing you have in football. In Britain, they used to be called the Lager Louds. Then, but, you know, violence in, in sports was a very serious issue. The, the most important thing for us is to appreciate the fact that you are witnessing the coming of a new generation of political actors. I think we still have a bit of gerontocracy here and there, but in the next one or two elections, we're going to have greater energy. The challenge for us is how to manage this energy, because there's a lot of passion out there. There's a lot of anger and frustration. The, the issue is, and these are good things, there is righteous indignation. How do we manage this passion? Because the fact that people have turned up at all, a rally by itself, a football match by itself, all these things generate passion. The challenge, and this is where the security agencies and other community leaders have a job to do, is to help to calm down the anxiety. And like Two-Face Idibia would say, vote, not be fight. So it's that we have to continue on this journey. It's a journey that is rewarding, but it's a journey that will be made easier if the political actors gather and stand on a portal of moral authority to say, no, we do not want violence. So political conversations, meetings, should not just be about politicians scheming about how to win elections. You know, and all these people who have, you know, there are, the spokespeople for the parties must also take responsibility. There are people who have perfected the art of abuse and insult. And there are people who are being co-opted because you want a bad thing done. So people must learn to be held accountable. For me, that is critically... Uh, what it's all about. We must learn to punish people for the behavior 
that they, you know, that they uh, undertake that is not in conformity with uh, public morals. And that is a job that we all have to join hands uh, to do. We do thank you very much indeed, uh, Most Reverend Matthew Kuga, convener of the National Peace Committee. Thank you very much, Chambele. Thanks for having us. All right. So, so there you go. That is it today. But I think we can take some of your messages today. I know we couldn't the last time. Well, this one comes through from Festus, who says, well, that our courts are disqualifying some candidates has exposed the flaws in how our political parties choose their candidates for elections. Time political parties stop the anti-democratic processes of choosing candidates for elections. The word is enough for the wise, he says. Well, this is from Pastor Law Alpha Cross, who says if there will be elections next year, the security agencies have to be adequately mobilized to play their constitutional roles, while the citizenry has to render useful assistance or peaceful exercise to be experienced. And this one is from Professor Inakina. He says all political parties must eschew violence because the country cannot afford another security lapse based on political affiliation and thuggery. Parties should make sure their supporters abstain from violence that can stir up any form of reprisal by both camps. Well, we hope to see that in the coming days. Well, let me see if I can quickly rush this one for time. Election violence, mm -hmm. Adeni Kawe is writing about, says, I'm not convinced the police are ready to fight election violence. The perpetrators of this violence are seen on videos. They, go up, they don't go after them, interrogate and conduct investigations to ascertain who their sponsors are. All we get are speculations and unproven accusations, and these perpetrators sail into the sunset to perpetrate violence again and again subscribe to Adenike Awe. Well, that's the way it's been on the program well, this well, morning. Well. So there you go. That is the show today. We thank you all for watching and for sending in your messages. We really are happy about them. But we will see you again tomorrow. I am Chamberlain and so I'm just saying have a very good day because we here will. <laughs> thank you for watching. I'm Maupe Ogun Yusuf. Yes, thank you for sharing your day with us. I am Bukola Samuel Wemimo. Since Chamberlain, you really do relish your Abuja identity, but we're still in Lagos. Maya Makinde, have a wonderful day.